Hello, this is going to be our lecture on the uh, 13 colonies, specifically focusing on the three colonial regions of the Southern colonies, the New England colonies, and the Mid-Atlantic colonies. So first, let's talk about those 13 original colonies. You're looking at the map from Georgia all the way up to Maine. And the first thing that we're going to do is start off with the southern colonies. And the southern colonies are from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. On the map, it shows West Virginia is separated, but that doesn't become a separate state until 1863. So just kind of imagine West Virginia and Virginia together. So I just want to show you first this geographic scope. Um, it is... 3,294 nautical miles to go from England to the first colony of Roanoke. So this is something that is a long journey um, and it's quite costly as well. So let's first talk about Roanoke. Roanoke was first founded in 18, oh sorry, 1584. English ships traveled to America and they were determined to claim land for England. Uh, before the Spanish Armada was defeated in 1588, the Spanish and the Portuguese were the number one and number two seafarer nations um, in the entire world. And so from you know, 1492, when Christopher Columbus, the Italian explorer, sailed on behalf of the Spanish crown, from that period to about 1584, really it was the Spanish and the Portuguese that were going into this new world, modern day Latin America. Um, and they were going in, in parts of the Caribbean, South America, uh, Mexico and Central America. And uh, these conquistadors were, you know, conquering a lot of the native peoples there. Um, and while they were doing so, you claiming a lot of the riches and a lot of the prestige. Uh, England at this point really wants to get some of that prestige. And so um, England, uh, through businesses, um, got a lot of money together, got permission from the English crown to go and explore. And the first colony was Roanoke. Um, and by 1587, they founded Roanoke and they called the area Virginia after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. Now, leaders left Roanoke um, a few years later to replenish supplies. And this is incredibly common, right? I'm going to go get supplies. I'm going to get more men and, and come back, and we will establish this a colony further. But by 1590, when these leaders returned, the, lot, the colony of Roanoke was lost. Uh, basically, there was elements of you know people who had quickly left the colony, but no one knows exactly where they went. Um, there was a contingency plan, though. When the um, original people left, um, they were told that if anything should happen, they should go to this specific marking in the woods, a specific tree, um, and then they would find them. And when the leaders returned back and they did not find the Roanoke inhabitants, they found a marking on the tree, Croatoan. And so it's one of history's mysteries, what happened to Roanoke. Now, this is really important because it's scary. And two, you know, a lot of money was lost. So the English could have at this time said, no, peace out. This is not something that we are going to do. We are not going to, uh, you know, waste all of our time and money and efforts into colonizing this new world. Um, but they did decide to try again, and they were successful. The first successful colony was Jamestown, and that was uh, founded a few decades later in 1607. So it's really important that you note the difference. This is the first successful um, English settlement. And this was founded by wealthy, well-to-do gentlemen of England. Think about second-born sons. These were people who were rich, but had no hope of inheriting any land or money. If you're the second born son, third, fourth, fifth, you're wealthy, you're well to do, as long as your parents are living. But uh, they will die and they will, and, and your older brother will inherit everything. So there's a uh, little chance of making it successfully to that, you know, high maintaining of wealth level. Um, if you are not that firstborn son, unless you married, of course, a very wealthy only child, female, and then you can inherit, you know, she can inherit um, her parents' riches. So um, these were men eager to kind of stick it out on their own, despite the fact they are wealthy gentlemen. And there was this mythology of the new world, that it was easy. You could just kind of go and pluck your riches. You just needed to know where to go. Um, there was this golden El Dorado. So the people who founded Jamestown were not incredibly prepared for what lie ahead.
So first I just want to show you, um, looking at this Google Earth, um, how it is going from England you know, all the way to Roanoke, because I do want to stress um, the risk that is involved, both, um, you know, your health and your life and financial and, you know, humiliation on behalf of the English crown if you're not successful. So you have English, go to Roanoke, then they go back to England um, to replenish supplies. And they could have given up by, you know, 1590, um, but they go and they find Jamestown in 1607. And there you can see kind of the geographic layout of Jamestown inside that um, cove, really kind of tucked away. And so if you go into Jamestown today, you can see the historical recreation of the fort. And it does turn into a fort. You can see the um, protective wall um, around the area. And this is because they soon discovered that the land of Jamestown and the land of the New World was not laced in gold and it was in fact inhabited. So let's look at some of these early settlers. Um, by 1635, this is a list of um, people bound to um, um, Jamestown and you can see the name of the ship in right here is the Merchant's Hope. So these are people who are taking the ship, they're boarding the ship, and they are looking for money, they're looking for trade, they're looking for riches, and they're gonna scoop back. This is also important to note because this colony is founded all around wealth and the seeking of wealth, and this is something that's gonna carry them on for centuries ahead, specifically as um, this debate about slavery is going to start. So if you look at this list um, and kind of scan the ages, you can see that generally speaking, this is a young crowd of people. We have 26, and that's kind of high off on the edge, right? 29, uh, we have 17, we have a 14 year old, 14, 22, 21. Uh, um, we do have a 32 year old, a 31 year old. Um, maybe those individuals had specific set of skills. Maybe they were um, specific when it came to you know, their craft. And we have a few women, right? A lot of women were not allowed or encouraged to go to uh, the new world and to the southern colonies. But women do have a specific set of skills at this time. They know how to cook and they know how to clean, which sounds super sexist um, in today's world of 2020. Um, but it's really not because cooking was, uh, you don't have an oven that could just be like heat 450, right? Um, you can't just like buy the chicken at the grocery store and like plop it in the oven. So um, this is, we had a sex-based division of labor at this point. So you know, these women know exactly um, how to churn the butter, how to um, pluck the chicken and clean it and cook it so that you don't die of salmonella. Um, and doing the laundry, same thing. We don't just have these washing machines. This is a specific set of skills. So a few women um, were allowed and encouraged to go um, in order to uh, you know, take care of some of those basic needs. And so you can see, you know, with this question, how many males are on the ship, females, and I kind of just went over the why. So let's talk about these characteristics of the people who originally settled Jamestown. One, young, right? Looking at, at the list from 1635, you know, these are young, generally healthy um, men. Unskilled. typically, like I said, second son of these wealthy families, hoping um, to get some wealth of their own. And as you can see from my ships list, male. So I really showed you evidence about how they're young and how they're mostly male. Um, I'm gonna go on and talk about how they're unskilled next. But first I do want you to take note of this definition here of joint stock companies right down here. So a joint stock company is um, a group of private investors and uh, you have investor A and B and C and D and they join together to create a stock um, and they say okay we are going to pay for you to go to Jamestown and we'll pay for all of the supplies and we'll pay for your trip and then we'll reap some of the benefits right so if you are successful you will get money and so will we. We just don't have to go over there. So what were they looking for? They were looking for gold. 
So let's talk about these unskilled men, because I don't really want to make a claim um, that they are unskilled without having specific evidence. So um, if we look at this source from um, Edmund Morgan's book, American Slavery, American Freedom, and you have this breakdown of early Jamestown, um, you know, skilled men. So settlers who started the colony, right, 36 gentlemen. And you can see in yellow, gentlemen by definition had no manual skill, nor could they be expected to work at ordinary labor. Labor. They were supposed to be useful for the force of knowledge. The company's laborers were, for the most part, footmen and such, and never did know what a day's work was. And a footman is somebody who would be like a, a butler, like somebody who like opens doors and presses your suit. Things that you're definitely not going to need um, in Jamestown in 1607. So um, of these breakdown of skilled men who started uh, Jamestown, you have four carpenters, two bricklayers, one blacksmith, one tailor, and one barber. I mean that barber. It's very important. So of these settlers who started the colony, you have 36 of these gentlemen, that fits that yellow definition, um, 69 non-gentlemen for a total of 105. And the first supply of additional settlers, you could see that they're increasing the non-gentlemen, right? Um, but, you know, for the most part, these are unskilled individuals. Now, um, it was very rough needless to say, um, the first few years of Jamestown. They experienced what's known um, historically as a starving time. And so let's read this document um, from John Smith about the starving time. Now all of us at Jamestown beginning to feel that sharp prick of hunger which no man can truly describe, but which he which hath tasted the bitterness thereof. Right? Why are they hungry? Probably because they didn't bring a lot of seeds with them. They didn't so the land, they didn't bring a lot of supplies or knowledge of even how to cultivate the land. So um, that's going to make them hungry. Then having fed upon horses and other beasts as long as they lasted, we were glad to make shift, which means to change. We were glad to eat the vermin, right, such as dogs, rats, and mice, and cats, ew. Um, all was fish that came to the net to satisfy cruel hunger as to eat boots, shoes, or any other leather come, some could come by. So this is a, this is definitely a problem when it comes to the founding of Jamestown. So why do you think people experience these problems? Like I said earlier, you don't have a lot of skilled men here. They weren't incredibly prepared for what lie ahead. They also didn't think that they would stay a crazy amount of time, right? We're going to go, we're going to pluck the, pluck the gold off of the tree, we're going to quickly find it, and then we're going to go back um, and, to England and you know make a name for ourselves. So, oh, sorry, just wanted to source that. We have George Percy, not John Smith, sorry, starting time, winter 1609 to 1610. So um, once the colonies do get established, the southern colonies though, which they do, um, they do make it through that starving time. They basically have um, John Smith and um, uh, an another uh, leader, uh, Lord DeWar, basically coming and saying, you will plant the corn or I will shoot you. Um, you will fish or I will shoot you. You will dig the latrine or I will shoot you. If you disagree with me, I will shoot you. And he basically said, we will make this work. We will make it survive because if we don't, we can't go back to England in disgrace. Um, there was also, of course, a lot of um, um, problems with the natives of the Powhatan nation. Um, and there was periods of peace with the Powhatans and they taught uh, the early settlers of Jamestown right, how to fish and how to cultivate the land, and then of course there were periods of war as well. John Rolfe, um, one thing that made the Southern Colonies really successful is he smuggled in tobacco from South America, um, and this became a major cash crop once the Southern Colonies started to grow tobacco on large scale, and then selling it back to England, they were making a ton of money. This transforms the Southern Colonies into a plantation society where planters grew cash crops um, on hundreds of acres, and then we're going to talk about how that also leads to the growth of slavery. Um, and then that you know encourages more people to settle. On a side note, John Rolfe married the princess, one of the princesses of the Powhatan nation named Pocahontas. Pocahontas then flees the New World, um, marries John Rolfe, disavows her Native American heritage, and renames herself Rebecca then goes on a speaking tour throughout England, 
as Rebecca talking about the virtues of being Christian. Um, and you can probably guess what happened to her. Native American going to England, going on a speaking tour throughout London. She gets sick and then she dies at a very young age. So let's transition from that story to society. So we have the economy is set up on this big plantation um, system growing tobacco, but you know you, you can't eat tobacco. Um, and we'll talk about um, that later. So society, right? Who were the people in this colony? Cheap labor, mostly done by indentured servants. And indentured servants were people who um, were really poor, usually in England, and they wanted to go to the new world, to live there, to settle. Um, and so they didn't have the money to travel. So they committed themselves for five to 10 years of labor working for somebody in exchange for transport. So they would get the room and board and they would get their trip to uh, the new world all paid for and they would work for that individual. And sometimes they would learn a skill, but indentured servitude was really, really rough. You're looking at about 10% of indentured servants live out their contract. And that's because there wasn't a ton of care for these individuals. Um, think about an indentured servant was kind of like buying a used car where you just kind of want to get your money's worth. And then if it dies in five years, you're like, okay, I think I got enough of my money's worth. You know, sucks that it died, you know, at year five instead of year seven, but whatever. It works. And so that, um, you know, steadily leads to a decrease in indentured servants. And by the late 17th century, so by the late 1600s, slave labor was increased um, because you could maximize your profit. Because now you're not buying a used car that's going to live five to six years. Now you're buying, you know, a, a Mercedes that will last um, a long time. So politics. Um, every colony in colonial region has their own political structure and I don't want you to think that this is because they wanted to break away from England because they did not want to break away from England um, especially at this time but it's kind of like Lord of the Flies you have a whole bunch of people who are now plopped in this new world and there needs to be some rules in order to regulate society so the most well-known government structure in the southern colonies um, was in Virginia again that's important to note because a lot of the founding fathers are going to be from Virginia right think about um, George Washington um, think about Thomas Jefferson so the first governmental system that was established really would be the House of Burgesses and this was formed in 1619 and it became this legislative body um, the first legislative body in the colonies. So let's look back again um, at our evidence um, to where I'm talking about um, indentured servants. So you can see here this primary source here, run away from the subscribers on the 15th of September, two Irish indentured servants, one named Maurice, you know, about five foot eight. Uh, and so you do have a ton of indentured servants who are going to run away because again, it was really hard labor. You don't have a really high survival rate. Um, and what's really key is the fact that indentured servants were white. And so if an indentured servant lived in one area um, and then ran away and could get far away enough, they could blend in as kind of like this free person or this non-indentured servant. Um, so you can see here in your subscribers or people who held the contract of the indentured servant. And it says their conversation will convince any person that they are natives of Ireland. And that's basically saying that, you know, um, the Irish are are poor. We all know that the Irish can't come to this new world on their own. So if you hear people, you know, with this thick Irish rogue, they're probably an indentured servant. But critical thinking, you know, why might it be difficult to find a runaway indentured servant? Because frankly speaking, you know, if if your whole labor source um, is is not easily identifiable, right? Except for this, you know. Irish road with this Irish accent that they have, they could run away and then blend in with another town. It's not like they have, you know, these brands or these markings, um, or they're all wearing these big red shirts that say indentured servant, right? That's, that's not happening. And that's really important to note because one reason why there was a transition to race based slavery is so that they could be easily identified. And we'll get back to slavery um, in a little bit. But first, right, let's dig deeper into the specific evidence um, about indentured servants. Um, indentured servants, um, you know, these were 
for, for the most part, you know, a lot of them were not um, well-behaved um, individuals. And that's because, again, these are typically rebellious, adventurous people. If you're willing to say, you know, peace out, mom and dad, I'm not going to see you ever again. I'm going to the new world. You know, there's this uh, element of, you know, rebelliousness already kind of in your nature. Uh, and so it got to be kind of hard to control these indentured servants. Again, they died really easily. Um, if, you know, you were a female indentured servant, which you need because they are going to do a lot of the cooking, they're going to do a lot of the cleaning, a lot of the household uh, chores, um, how do you control them when it comes to dating? And if they got pregnant, oh my goodness, you would tack on more time um, onto their um, service. Um, if they broke a um, shovel, you would tack on more time. And so again, a lot of these indentured servants were not happy about that and they rebelled in specific ways right they ran away they ran away and they stole fornication stealing profanity just unruly behavior sexual misbehavior and other so fun fact a young servant was frequently running away from his master to his family and he was ordered back to his master and his parents were sentenced to sit in the stocks for every day they received their son at their house. Um, those are parents who um, basically were too old to be accepted into indentured servitude. Um, and so they traveled to the New World as a family and they brought their son. And they subjected their son to indentured servitude. Um, and so this is kind of uh, the effect of that. Um, from Edmund Morgan, American Slavery, American Freedom, page 234. With lack of social mobility among servants, it became hard to control their behavior. Englishmen in Virginia continued to oppress Englishmen, and the men at the top allowed the discontent of the men at the bottom until their discontent re resulted in rebellion. And again, this is kind of why this scholar here is explaining why indentured servitude didn't really work out. You have these you know, men who are not at the top in England, but they go to the new world and they're pretty much you know, at the top and they want to rule over the people at the bottom. And of course they don't like it and they rebel. So we have this transition to slave labor. Due to uprisings um, um, and runaways, the amount of European indentured servants decreased and slaves Increased, So you can see um, Europeans um, by 1660 making up most of the share of servants, but by 1680s it starts to decrease a little bit more with European laborers. And you can see by the 1700s, um, African slaves um, make up more than 75%. Um, they after we have the Middle Passage, which we'll get to, they become um, African slaves become really cheap. Um, and again, the long-term investment of a slave becomes more economically sound, which is is horrible. This concept of owning a human being and and you know um, you know turning a person into a commodity is incredibly horrible, but this was the mindset of this time. So let's talk about what this Middle Passage was. So before we have the Middle Passage, um, which is the uh, forced passage that brought Africans to the Americas, uh, before we have this Middle Passage, African slaves were really expensive um, because we didn't have a way to mass transport them. Uh, the New World didn't. So. But there was this new way of thinking of, okay, let's just you know, take a big ship, um, park it outside of these countries in West Africa. So we're looking at modern day Senegal, modern day Gambia, um, and we will um, take the Africans. Um, we'll take the Africans um, and either because uh, a tribe is selling a group to us or because a, a tribe in Africa is selling another group of prisoners of war to um, you know, the Europeans or to the Americas um, or because they you know, another tribe didn't pay tribute to another tribe and so they're paying tribute with a person and then we would take that person and then sell them into slavery um, and in return we would give those, you know, those tribes in Africa, we'd give them guns, we'd give them weapons so that they can get, you know, more land and more territory and then they would, you know, send more, of course, um, to us. Um, and there, when I say us, I mean, you know, the New World or to the Americas. 
And there was even an economic system set up where, oh, you know, we can cram these um, slaves into the ships. You can see um, in this image here just how crammed they are. We can cram them on all levels, right? The top deck, the bottom deck. We can lay them in slats and stack them on top of each other. And if 10% die, 20% die, that's fine because they're just, you know, nothing. And um, that, and we'll still be able to make a ton of money, even if 20% die. And a lot of these um, African slaves were taken to the American colonies, the Caribbean, um, South and Central America. So this was a horrible system. It's estimated that um, about 2 million slaves died um, on this Middle Passage because the conditions were just incredibly ruthless. In addition, you might be on this boat for a good three, four months before you even left um, Africa um, and not even knowing and all the people that you're surrounded with are from other tribes so they might be your enemy they might speak a different language and so you you can't even assume that when they're all together they can even effectively communicate with each other you can see here some Africans being just like tossed off the boat if some of them were unruly or if they were sick and thought to be spreading disease you got tossed off the boat and you drowned in the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see here um, the picture on the left, you know, um, the natives uh, of, of Africa getting ki basically kidnapped um, and stolen into not just a lifelong sentence of servitude, because that's horrible, but what's even worse than a lifelong sentence of servitude is a multi-generational lifelong sentence of servitude. So it's not just this woman and her children, it's this person's child and grandchild and great-grandchild and great-great-grandchild. And so, you know, a lot of people will argue, oh, well, you know, slavery has existed forever or um, these were prisoners of war and this happened to prisoners of war. But something that never happened to prisoners of war is that their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and all of that would also become slaves. That is like next level evilness. So um, let's look at this um, interesting narrative of the life of um, Equiano, um, which is a, who was a slave. Um, this was published in 1789. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocating us. This produced copious uh, perspiration. So like, again, everyone's sweating and, um, you know, sick and together so that the air soon became unfit for even breathing respiration from a variety of loathsome smells. So what are those smells? Oh, the sickness of slaves, many of which who had died, right? So you have like these rotting bodies that haven't even, you know, been removed yet because you can see here they're packed so tightly in. Um, thus falling victims to the um, improvident avarice, as I may call it, of their purchasers. Um, this wretched situation was given aggravated by the galling of the chains, right? The chains are still on you, now becoming insupportable. And the filth of the necessary tubs, right? These large buckets of human waste onto which the children um, often fell and were almost suffocated. Um, the shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered a whole scene of horror almost inconceivable. And so you have all of this evidence here um, from the decks of the ships, all of these um, drawings of the time, just really adding evidence to the horrificness of the slave trade. So let's look at this um, scholarly analysis here. Um, once the ship set sail, the slaves entered the notorious Middle Passage across the Atlantic to colonial America. The shortest voyage could be made in three weeks, but the equatorial winds were uncertain, sometimes stranding a ship for weeks. The crew forced the captain to throw some slaves overboard to make the provisions and fresh water last longer for the sailors. Right, so again, you, know, you have this scholar, this historian, that's really adding the depth of knowledge to these primary sources. Um, the shippers had two not entirely compatible goals, to cram as many slaves aboard as possible and to get as many as possible across the Atlantic alive and healthy. Most slavers, right, the people who you know, transported the slaves, were tight packers who calculated that the greatest profits came from landing the largest number, accepting the loss of some en route as an essential cost. 
On most ships, the slaves were jammed into dark holes and into wooden shelves that barely allowed room to turn over. At six feet long by 16 inches wide and about 30 inches high, the standard space for a slave was half that allowed to transport convicts. Right, so they treated convicts better than the slaves. Lacking clothes and bedding, the slaves slept on their rough wooden shelves and in the wastes that their bodies produce overnight. And so just kind of looking at this, right, what does this mean? One, slavers would throw slaves who were alive overboard in order to provide food and water for the crew. Right, let's look some more. Slavers were only considered uh, only considered profits, right? As I mentioned earlier, 10 to 20% died on the Middle Passage because of this um, economy of scale. Slaves were bound together. They lived and died bound together. And with all of the bodily fluids of the living and dead produced on top of one another. So again, this is just kind of next level evilness. So let's look at um, where were slaves transported. Um, based on this graph, um, a lot of these slaves were transported to the Caribbean um, until you have about the 1800s when you start to have um, a massive slave rebellion in Haiti. Um, and this yellow line is Brazil. You can see it constantly going up. And you can see mainland North America, which would be um, you know, uh, Canada and you know, uh, the 13 original colonies and later the United States. Um, it's relatively low. Um, compared to Latin America. So let's talk about this triangle trade because the change, this slaves um, are a key part of this economic system um, that really supported uh, the new world um, in blue, um, Africa or destroyed Africa in red um, and supported um, Europe in green. So slaves are sold to the Americas. That's going from red to blue. Then slaves produce sugar in the West Indies which is then exported to the colonies, and then, after that, manufactured goods, tobacco, and rum are exported to Europe to fund slave ships. So you can see how you have this you know, triangle trade uh, that's all built and dependent on slavery, and it exists to support slavery. And this is really key, because as people develop conversations of, um, it's kind of bad to own people, uh, yes, um, you also have this thought of, but if we take slavery out of the equation, then this economic system in the world will crumble. Well, yes, and, right? And so you have a number of people who are not just economically invested in slavery, but they also become socially invested in slavery because they get to rule over another person. So you cannot discount just human nature's, I, you know, um, ability to want to rule over somebody else. And then again, this is a world issue. I don't want you to think that this is just in the American colonies. This is a massively world you know, economic system. So how were slaves sold and how was slavery codified or codified? Codified in meaning like, well, now we have to have rules on slaves and slavery. You know, now we have to have um, a system of how to rule over the slaves. So you can see from this primary source here, um, the Lancaster Government Orders, published 1702 to 1712. Robert uh, Carter Esquire, complaining to this court against two uncourageable Negroes. So uncourageable means like they, they could not be tamed. They could not be controlled. Uh, praying the order of this court, meaning, you know, he's begging the court to help him with these, you know, with his slaves who are just not doing what they're told. Um, so he dismembered them. It is therefore ordered that for the better proclaiming the said uh, Negroes and deterring others, meaning deterring other slaves um, from ill practices, that said Robert Esquire have full power according to law to dismember the said Negroes and either of them by cutting off their toes, which I, I don't think is helpful at all in this situation. Um, but basically saying that, yes, if you have slaves who are unruly, which of course they would be, um, then you can cut off their toes. That is completely legal and that is completely okay. That is how you codify, uh, codify slavery. Um, this is from um, 1786, a later letter to uh, Philo Africanus upon slavery in London. Um, the principal source of the slave trade 
are the captives taken in war, which is indeed often kinded or given or traded by those tyrannical princes upon small occasions, but generally arises from rebellion or default in the payments of tributes. And that kind of goes to what I was saying earlier about how slaves became slaves. When a tribe is conquered, they become tributary to the conqueror, and upon failure in the payment, the war is renewed, and the captives on either side are made slaves. So how did you become a slave in Africa? You know, you were captured. You were this prisoner of war, or you were somebody who was turned into tribute. Now the next part becomes, well, how do you become a slave if you're already in America and you're not African, right? You were born in America. And the answer to that question is, if your mom was a slave. If your mom was a slave, you're a slave. If your mom is free, you're free. So um, if you are a free black woman um, and you have a child, then wonderful, you are, uh, your offspring is, is free as well. Um, if you are a female slave, this is disgusting. If you were a female slave and you were raped by your white master and you had a baby, then that child is a slave. Which is why you often see heavier punishment for white women who um, get sexually involved with a black male or a black slave, you know, a, a, a male slave. Because then that offspring is free. But if you have a female slave and then you know, a child that is a product of rape, that's a slave. You don't see as much punishment for that historically. So let's look at this map so we can see some geographic scope of the growth of slavery. So are there any colonies that do not have slavery? No, pretty much all of them do. This area right here, that's Maine, that was actually part of Massachusetts at the time. So, uh, New England colonies. So, let's just quickly kind of go over some New England colonies in our next video. So, I'm going to pause this here, and then our next video will be focusing on the New England and the Mid-Atlantic colonies.